Politics really just means governing or leading a group of people. And the Bible has a lot to say about leading a group of people, has a lot to say about legislation. You know, the truth is going to offend, but my attitude shouldn't. What's so polarizing right now is the the anger and the animosity and the bickering. The believer has to be the better person and you have to work on relationships. Hey, don't let this divide us. Um, and pride, that's why That's why this is so hot. It's pride, pride on both sides, of course. Your faith comes out in your politics. And of course you have the great divide, you know, in our country between uh, Democrats and Republicans and, and what's a priority, what's not a priority. And then that opens up a whole nother can of worms. So I think that's that's what I do, faith first. I trust in Jesus Christ. God is, is, is my priority. Uh, salvation's not coming on Air Force One. Hello and welcome to Unbelievable, the show that gets Christians, skeptics, and all those in between debating the topics that matter to all of us. I'm your host, Billy Hollowell, and today we return to our series on the intersection of faith and politics. The debate applies more widely to other contexts, but in this episode, we're focusing more on American public life. How can we talk about politics in a way that is edifying? You know, who in political life are we? Is political life inseparable from who we are in real life? Can Christians reorient politics for the good of others? And is gentleness possible in American politics? We're going to get into all of that and more. My guest today is Shane Eidelman, the founder and lead pastor of Westside Christian Fellowship in California. He also began the Westside Christian Radio Network. It's wcfradio.org. You can check that out. His sermons, books, articles, and radio program have sparked change in the lives of many across America. We want you to hit that subscribe button here on Premiere. And if the show raises more questions for you today, we would love to hear from you. But for now, let's get going. Shane, welcome to Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm I'm doing great. And as you know, I love this topic, uh, passion, a passion for uh, this area of, of discussion. It's so important, especially right now. It's so important. Yeah, we have big elections coming up. Obviously, politics is heating up. Politics is always one of those topics that gets people uh, really going. But right now, because of those elections that are coming, especially in America and the UK, uh, potentially we see this conversation kicking up. Before we get into that, though, I want people to get a sense of who you are. So I actually want to start with a little bit of your faith backstory. Uh, where where did faith come into your life? Let's start there. Take us a little bit through your testimony there. All right, I'll give you the abridged version really quick. I grew up uh, in Southern California. Uh, obviously, I'm in California. Grew up in Southern California and uh, had a concept of God when I was younger, but um, in my 20s, just really walked away from that relationship and got into, you know, everything the world has to offer, uh, actually got into, uh, you know, so I do a lot of, on my YouTube channel, a lot about health and fitness from a biblical perspective. So I got into, uh, steroid use and abuse, uh, and then alcoholism, the party scene, uh, but also was kind of working hard, but then on the weekends I would blow it and, and just as it really is depressing. Um, those things never fulfill you. And then towards the end of my twenties, I just began to just, everything was kind of falling apart. That's sometimes how God gets our attention. Uh, and I was skeptical, of course. Uh, my mom was a, a Christian, but I was, you know, just really skeptical. But when you get to your wits end, you know, when you hit rock bottom and I said, okay, Lord, if you're out there, you know, I, I repent, I, I believe and please just help me. And then just, just there's such a change. And that's what I think people need to realize um, with especially Christianity, you can experience God. There, it's it's experiential that lines up with Scripture, of course. But then the Word of God come, comes comes alive. I don't want to live that lifestyle anymore. And then the the joy and the peace uh, of of just that that relationship. Uh, and then from that came the books and the article and speaking engagements, and, and then eventually uh, became a pastor. But the backstory that's really interesting is I had dyslexia. So I barely graduated high school, 1.8, uh, le- learning and reading wow. disabilities. I hated to read. Now I love to read when you know it. Um, and then just- And you just, write books. Uh, and you write books. Yeah. As, and, you know, yeah. You did. can't write. Normally you can't write books. with. So it's just kind of funny that God's called me to write books. Granted, I had a great editor. My mom initially, I mean, she would just redline those manuscripts and it was, it was pretty bad, but eventually just got better and better. And then, as you know, I write articles now for uh, a lot of the different um, 
mainline Christian news sources out there. And that's, that's kind of everything in, in just a few minutes of where, where God brought me to now. You know, for you, and, and we're talking about a lot of different topics here, you know, obviously you're a pastor primarily, that's what you do. You are looking at faith and pointing people towards right. it through radio, through writing, as we just described and discussed, you know, but we're talking today, obviously about politics, political issues, social issues, these things that go on in the world around us. You know, when, at what point in your life slash ministry did you feel, and maybe from the beginning, that these were issues that were important as a spiritual leader for you to be talking about and addressing? Yeah, well, it's interesting because in my 20s, you know, the prodigal son state is what I call it. I had no desire for anything to do with politics. I didn't, I didn't, maybe I knew who our president was, obviously, but beyond that, it didn't really affect me. It doesn't, you know, when you're young, it really, um, it's, yeah, it's just kind of boring. But then again, when I, when I, when, when God got my heart and reading the Bible and seeing politics really just means governing or leading a group of people. And the Bible has a lot to say about leading a group of people has a lot to say about legislations. Actually, uh, when America was, was founded, you know, from over from England, we adapted William Blackstone's commentaries of the laws of England. And uh, they, they use scripture references in there. And so I started to read about um, early uh, revival history, uh, or early history of, of America, and just begin to see how it was so intertwined. Um, and also now these issues that are so polarizing are actually very biblical. I mean, every every hot topic you can think of has a lot of biblical application. And so what you're seeing, though, a lot of pastors, especially in America, are really, they're either embracing this and, and, and help leading the people, or they're actually backing away from it, and they don't want to talk about any of these controversial topics. So I think it was a God-given desire. I think God gives us different giftings for different callings. Not every pastor is going to be as passionate as I am about these topics. Uh, but that's why, because God, that's kind of where God wants me to direct a lot of my energy. So that's when it started, when I came back to the Lord. And then when you start to have kids and pay taxes and, you know, you start, oh, wow, there's this, this is, this stuff is, is pretty important. You know, the security of your nation, your taxation, uh, violence, legislation. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty important. And God has a lot to say about these areas. Well, and that's where this topic gets very interesting because you have a lot of people and obviously in, in the UK, for instance, in America, there are a lot of similarities and differences, but the, the big sort of 30,000 foot question, and, and it's sort of what you were just talking about is to what lengths do these things come together? Do faith and politics come together? Because you have a, a move of people who will say, and I want you to respond to this, but we have a separation of church and state, and we could talk about what that actually means in your view, um, but we have this separation of church and state, and there needs to be a separation at every level of how we engage even in the political system. Right. And so there, again, there are different levels of that, but how do you respond when you, when you hear people talk about that piece of, of the puzzle, the separation of, of church and state? Well, I get that a lot, obviously, being here in California, <clears throat> and and let me just unpack it real quick. Obviously, there has to be some type of separation between, you know, the, the role of the government has a distinct and different role than the role of the church, even biblically speaking. The government, Romans 13, is to defend the nation, defend her people, where the church has the, um, the, the calling to shepherd and lead the spiritual care. So they are separate in that idea. But they're, from the founding, we'll talk about America first. From the founding, it was to, they were to be interwoven. And so the separation of church and state, as many know, is not in the Constitution. Uh, for about 150 years, the Supreme Court acknowledged that, you know, God can be in government. But then 150 years later, I don't know, people versus Rugels or something where they, they said, now there needs to be a, a wall of separation and the church and the state, what they basically did, <clears throat> the founders wanted the, the political and the, and, and, the, and the religious spirit to be interwoven, that God's word should direct political outcomes, political decisions. But the Supreme Court removed that and said the church can no longer uh, be involved whatsoever in the political arena. And of course, Thomas Jefferson's letter written to the Baptist in Danbury, Connecticut, I believe, he was actually telling them, don't worry, Baptist. 
don't worry, the, the government's not going to come in and, 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 and impose a national religion on you. There will be a separation of church and state. And so they, they totally took that phrase and twisted it to where it actually means the opposite. And of course, that's when the Establishment Clause comes in. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. So they can't establish a religion, but we can't openly and acknowledge, openly acknowledge a sovereign hand of God that has directed our nation. That you just look at, they like to say precedents, right? Precedents, precedents. What did the Supreme Court, what did they first rule on? What, that's how they kind of form opinions. That's how they should. And if you look at, decades and decades and decades of precedents, you'll see that God God was supposed to be in our court system. The public school system was started in 1620 to teach kids the word of God. And so that, that has really actually been used now as a weapon when separation of church and state was actually to, to protect the church, not uh, inhibit or prohibit her. Now, and that, of course, is a, a 30,000 view, you know, foot view perspective on this particular issue. You know, we then have to dig deeper, right? That's the big battle. Yes. The courts have been fighting. Obviously, we've seen numerous Supreme Court battles in America over the past couple of years over this very issue. There was a football coach, Joe Kennedy, um, who was praying at the 50 yard line after, after, you know, public school football games and his case went to the Supreme Court and he won a victory there to be able to pray on the 50 yard line. But we've seen these, these sort of clashes between church and state again and again, as you were detailing. Right. And there have been different perspectives on how that should unfold and be looked at. Um, but of late, the religious liberty victories have been sort of notable on that front. But we then have to take all of that and bring it down to the individual level, because, again, we're in this election mm -hmm. year. And, you know, when people choose to engage in the political process from a Christian perspective, when Christians engage, you know, what right. strategies would you say could be employed to prioritize faithfulness over political victory, right? How do, how do Christians approach this in a way that when they're going to the polls, when they're considering these issues, they're ensuring that their faith is always coming first before maybe their politics? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that could take on a lot of different angles uh, for sure. But I would say at the heart of that is, you know, the truth is going to offend, but my attitude shouldn't. So what's so polarizing right now is the, the anger and the animosity and the bickering and the fighting and the, just the, you know, tit for tat kind of thing. So as a Christian, my faith is, is first. So from that, of course, gentleness, meekness, humility, but also we're called to be very bold. And so when we engage the political arena, um, when we've got legislation that will harm children, we have legislation that will, I mean, we can go through the whole list. As a Christian, my faith, you can't separate faith from politics. I know they say that. Um, and ideally, I guess some people can, but as a genuine believer, uh, a Christian, it's, it's, inter it's, it's who you are. And so your faith comes out in your politics. And of course, you have the great divide, you know, in our country between, uh, Democrats and Republicans and, and what's a priority, what's not a priority. And then that opens up a whole nother can of worms. So I think that's, that's what I do. Faith first. I trust in Jesus Christ. God is, is, is my priority. Uh, salvation is not coming on Air Force One, but we can, uh, really set the tone of our nation by the legislation. Now you can't change a person's heart by forcing rules on them, but you can restrain evil by the legislation. A, a perfect example of this, our DA here in Los Angeles County is just, it's, they want to get him recalled. It's that bad um, of what they're, you know, allowing and releasing back into the, the general public. Criminals Criminal. being released into yes. the public after somebody's found, yeah. you know, they're, they're arrested, they're then released and that's created a problem there. Yes, absolutely. You know, it, it's so as we sort of think about this, because you mentioned a couple of things, one of the, the hallmarks of politics right now, uh, I think everywhere, but in particular in America, as we inch toward this November election, is this anger, you know, this political frustration that people have. It exists on both mm -hmm. sides of the aisle, and we've seen it manifest in different ways on both sides of the aisle. What in your view, especially, and we, and we can talk both people in general, obviously, but, but Christians in, in particular, this, this anger, when this political fervor gets out of control, how does it spiritually impact people and how can we sort of contain that in our own lives to ensure that we approach this in an appropriate yeah. way? 
Well, I will freely admit that that is challenging because politics that used to talk about, um, you know, paving the road or the union, the wages of the union, the benefits, or, um, you know, uh, uh, many different things. Now we're actually talking about huge, huge moral issues, especially in the school districts here in California or, or gender identity surgery, uh, or, and, and of course the abortion debate. And now we've got these huge, huge political, you know, hot buttons that are, that are so important. Um, and so as a Christian, it, it, it has to be, it, it, it gets you fired up, right? Of course. I mean, we're talking about our kids and our grandkids and what we're leaving them. And we just, and it can be very discouraging. And so anger worketh not the righteousness of God. We never get things done. Now there's righteous indignation, right? And being what I'm upset at drives me to the prayer closet more so. Uh, it doesn't not to lash out on people. And so the anger um, has to be restrained. And a lot of times, if, you know, for me, the more time I spend with God, the more time in his word, I'm in worship, I'm in prayer, I'm in fasting. From that is where you get the spiritual health of your soul. And so what we are seeing is a lot of Christians. I mean, the state of politics right now is a reflection of our spiritual condition. It, it, it simply reflects it. So Yes, we feel that anger, but we have to make sure that anger doesn't come across in a way that's now going to harm our message. Um, however, mm. we're, we're so polarized now that, um, that there's just no way we cannot offend or because we're speak even just speaking the truth is going to offend people. But that's the key. The truth is going to offend, but I hope my attitude doesn't. Hey, I love you enough to speak the truth and love. That's wrong. We're not going to allow that. This shouldn't be happening in our school districts. Um, so it's basically not tit for tat, right? You see a mean post, so you go back at them. You see a mean tweet, so you go back at them. You see, you know, they yell at you, you yell at them. They drop some, cur you know, and so we've got to, as Christians, we've got to be definitely better than that. Uh, but also let the anger propel us to a deeper relationship with God, because from that relationship, is how we're really going to make a difference. Yeah, I have to ask you a question I wasn't I wasn't going to ask, but you just said something that I think is very interesting. And those who are listening who may be agnostic or they may not be connected to a faith, they may not understand, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to give you a chance to explain it. They may not understand um, fasting or prayer. You talked about when, oh, when yeah. these things sort of happen, you're feeling that anger, you're experiencing this politically, that you would turn into those things to have a deeper relationship with God. Um, I know right. fasting is a big thing for you in your in your work in ministry. Can you explain that? Um, and, and even some Christians who don't fully understand why one might fast and pray in the midst of dealing with political fervor and chaotic things happening in their country. Yeah. Well, I mean, first we look at the Bible and you can go Old Testament, you can go New Testament, and you see the importance of fasting. And what it is, it's not like a work uh, it's not like you're beating yourself up and, and woe is me. And the Old Testament was a sign of mourning. But in the New Testament, Jesus said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. So for me, fasting is giving up an appetite for a greater appetite. I'm, I'm giving up this appetite for food for a greater appetite to seek God, whether it's a couple meals a day, whether it's water fasting, extended water fasting. I'm, 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 and, and it's a believer, there is a competing will within us. Right. We have the Holy Spirit, God's spirit in us. And you can tell that's where the peace and joy and everything comes from. But we still have that old nature that wants to the, the old Shane Eidelman to come back, come out and play. Right. And wants to wants to pull me back. So fasting actually starves that appetite as well. It starves that pull of the flesh because you are basically just draining the fuel source of the flesh. Because although food's great and good, uh, especially a lot of us now are addicted. Uh, to so many different ad addictions. And so fasting begins to just starve that out so I can even hear the voice of God better. I can be more in tune with God. And then, of course, prayer. If you don't, if you don't pray, it's just a diet uh, and you'll lose some weight through ketosis. But other than that, and then prayer gives that extra. And, and it's hard to explain, but it's hard to actually pray after you eat. I mean, try praying after Thanksgiving dinner. Try praying after Easter lunch. Try praying after a full meal. I mean, it's, it's hard, even though it's good and God given food is there's a, that fasting is setting aside a season 
uh, for that. I know this will be out in the UK as well. I mean, the UK has a history of fasting with, with Whitfield and Wesley. Uh, you have the greatest revivals that ever took place in the history of the world are there in the UK and in Wells in Scotland. That whole area there uh, is just, just, and they, they always prayed and fasted. And that seemed to bring just the fire of God down again for, for that spiritual awakening that we so desperately need today. So I want to, that was really helpful to, I think, give context for people so they can understand that perspective. And I want to pivot back to looking at our culture, right? Looking at you know, Christian morals, considering multicultural societies that we live in with lots of different viewpoints, obviously on faith and politics and other issues, what in your view is the appropriate infusion of Christian moral principles into politics? You know, how do you find sort of that, that level that is appropriate? Well, it is, I mean, it is different depending on where you live. I mean, if you're in China or the Middle East or South Korea or North Korea, I mean, obviously, but, um, for now, at least, God gave us a republic. We're not really a de- democracy. We're a, pub- a republic where we appoint people in positions of office who will vote accordingly. And so if you look at from the pilgrims, Puritans coming over 1620 uh, to the advancement of the gospel, uh, and then and then the, the legislation, uh, the court system, everything was kind of founded and grounded on God's word. Even John Jay, uh, the first chief justice, said, he gives all credit to Jesus in his will and testament, final will and testament. And so you see our, our heritage is rich with Christian principles. So we are, when everybody says, well, you can't force your, your, you know, your views. Well, we're, we're trying to maintain, we're trying to uphold, we're trying to regain lost ground. So I think our Christianity is, is we're called to, to, to have it infiltrate every area of society, not push it on people, not uh, be angry and, and forceful. But whether I have to choose God or man, we have to choose God all the time. So I think in the school districts, from curriculum uh, to, to everything, the problem is we've drifted so far. It's like the Titanic has been struck. Okay, how do you, how do you fix it now? Uh, so I think Christian principles should be integrated into all areas of society. And of course, people say, well, you can't force this. Or what about what this person believes? And, um, and that's why we do have, you know, the freedom, but you couldn't even run for office in their first 13 colonies unless you believed in God, the Father and the, and the Holy Spirit. You, you, it's in their constitutions. Uh, now I don't necessarily agree with that, but it just shows we're not trying to push something on anyone. We're trying to hold the line and recapture, regain what was initially already set and established. Now, we have about two minutes before we go to a break here, and so I'm going to throw a question to you, and I, I do want to tackle it here before the break, but you know, has Christian silence, in your view, played a role in the emergence of new political ideologies, new thought processes? Oh, well, that yeah, I think that's a no-brainer. Silence is um, Silence actually speaks volumes. I think we forget that. Well, I'm not going to say anything. Well, you just said something. You said a lot. When we don't come out against, and that's why, you know, and I know school teachers, it's hard. That's why they don't come out and say, we can't teach this curriculum. I don't want to use my job. I know firemen in LA County who don't want to wear the little rainbow flag in June and police, but we're just, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm not in their shoes. So I don't, but I, but silence is how we've actually gotten in the position we are in. If we could go deeper, the silence of the American pulpit is alarming. Uh, it should be, we should be, we should be, we should be calling out to God and, and, and the, and the pulpits aflamed with righteousness again. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the famous quote, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and women to do nothing. Uh, but again, I don't think we should do it out of anger. It has to be God driven, but boldness is always the fruit of God working in your heart. And so, yeah, silence is actually, I believe silence has got us in the position we are in today. Well, we need to take a quick break. I'm Billy Hollowell, and you're listening to Unbelievable with me and also Pastor Shane Eidelman. And he challenges the idea that, you know, in this current moral decline and relativism, that the battle is too advanced and that Christians can 
cannot make a difference. He believes that Christians can make a difference. So he challenges that idea. Uh, a lot more to talk about on the other side of the break. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Take a moment to rate the show on whatever podcast platform you're using. And as always, you can email us at unbelievable at premier.org.uk and get in touch on social media. It's at unbelievable for X, formerly known as Twitter, at premier unbelievable for Instagram, and also Facebook. It's Premier Unbelievable. If you want to interact with us over there, we'll be back in just a moment here on Premier Unbelievable. Pretty much universally, social science suggests that many of the institutions that we hold dear that shape us, that provide us social support, a huge amount of this used to happen anyway inside of these traditional religious structures, and there really has been nothing to replace it. It's amazing how quickly ostensible deontologists transform before our very eyes into utilitarians on this question. We're talking about what the self is here. I mean, atheists believe in the self. Uh, everybody believes in the well, self. Well, no, that's not, I mean, that, that, that I, I find difficult to believe. Why, why would an atheist believe in the self? The self is a series of non-deciding mechanisms. The arguments against God are, are fairly compelling, and I think the arguments against atheism are fairly compelling. The difference is that most people who believe in God have expressed doubts, and a lot of people who are atheists tend to be more religious in this way than many of the people who are God believers. If people listening agree with me that free will in fact doesn't exist, and simultaneously agree with you that free will is somehow necessary for the upkeep of civilization, then I would simply ask them to consider who's relying on the delusion here. This show does seem to have an extraordinary capacity for putting me face to face with people that I've been talking smack about online, so <laughs> thanks again. Welcome back to part two of this discussion on whether we can be gentle in politics. You're tuned in to Premier Unbelievable with me, Billy Hollowell, and my guest today is Shane Eidelman. And just so you know, we're going to be talking to others on this topic as well. We are getting uh, Shane Eidelman's perspective on all of these issues. You're going to hear things you agree with, uh, some things you don't, but we'll be having some other conversations on the other side of this as well um, as we dive into these important issues about the intersection of faith and politics. Now, Shane, we want to tackle some listener questions here. So I'm going to throw some of these out to you. Okay. And some of them are very challenging and also very interesting. Um, but we have Tony from Greenwich who asks, how have we gotten here? What has led us to all the drama and division that we are seeing when it comes to American politics and the church? And so I'm going to let you answer that, Shane. We were starting to kind of talk about that at the end of the, yeah. of the last segment. Well, the drama, I mean, it's so, it's so polarized. And it wasn't like this in the 80s. You know, even uh, JFK, uh, when he ran, then, of course, Reagan. And, and what you're seeing then is what I mentioned earlier. We're talking about enormous, and I can't, I can't um, underscore that anymore, enormous implications uh, that are happening because of the choices we're making political. Um, and I'm, I'm three hours from San Diego, and I can tell you, the 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 open border is the fentanyl i mean crisis is 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 out is is unbelievable uh the types of people crossing the border of course we love you know people who are really seeking help and need help but the majority of the people coming over are are going to be very uh could be very uh dangerous to our family and to our children that's just facts that there's nothing to do with propaganda that's just facts and then you look at uh how they're celebrating being able to to murder a child uh, at nine months here in California and New York and uh, uh, surgery for a 10 year old that wants to change surgery. I mean, these are, these are huge and they have enormous consequences to them. So you are seeing this, this, this getting even more, more um, intense because these are big issues that have really big consequences. Also uh, from a spiritual perspective, you are seeing kingdoms colliding. I mean, light and darkness, right and wrong, good and evil are colliding. And so it becomes even more so, uh, more so dramatic. And the church, <clears throat> but again, what portion of the church, Christians, okay, what a, a genuine believer versus those calling them a Christian? I mean, we get into the whole, you know, white nationalism and, and MAGA versus the Democrat p party in Hollywood. And, and, and then you, but then in the middle, though, you do have what I call, 
genuine, spirit-filled believers on fire for God who simply want to make a difference. And so our political views are going to line up with whatever side is beginning to bring back in righteous causes. Um, I'm not concerned as much about our president's character as I am about the direction of our nation. That's that's the big concern, and that's why there's a huge divide. We're actually div divided over what is America, what what is it anymore, and that's where there's mm. a huge you know huge upheaval. And, and you know, one of those big debates also centering on you know policies, the things that are going to be enacted versus personality, and people falling on very different sides of that. You know, some people finding the policies are the most important thing, as I think that's what you're saying. And then others saying, well, no, the personality, because of what comes with it, is the most important thing. And so, you know, there, there's a lot there to unpack, and we'll get into some of that in our third segment. But I want to read you another question. This is from Sally in Alabama. She said, I'm a Christian working with refugees. I want to be a good Christian witness, but also want to vote Democrat. I don't ignore the policies of the Democrats, but similarly, I can't ignore the character and corruption of Trump as a leader. Can I be a Christian and vote Democrat? That's a that is a, that's a flammable question, Shane Eidelman. Yeah, it is. Uh, <clears throat> boy, how much time do we have? No, just kidding. I'll get right into it. So <clears throat> the first thing I heard was her heart for the refugees, and I can I, I can understand where she's coming from. And here's where the big confusion is, I think, and I've talking to a lot of Christians, they're not, they, they didn't really know this, but the role of government is not the role of the church and vice versa. So when you have, you, you can't have the president of the United States, here's an example saying, hey, look at, we just have to turn the other cheek. No, that's for an individual believer. My, my role, your role as a president is to protect us. And so, yes, as the believer, I can care about the refugee. But as the government protecting her citizens, then that's where the, the borders comes in or handling things differently because they're called to protect where I'm called to, you know, obviously reach out. And of course we can get into, um, you, you know, you look at you, there's reports out there. You can look into the giving records. I mean, Republicans far out give Democrats to these causes. It's actually the church's role, not the government to help. Uh, those who are refugees and those who are hurting. It's our role as, as a Christian to come alongside those people, not the government, because they have no way to get gauge. Is this a genuine you know, need or are we enabling this person? Um, and so I've heard that, but I don't quite understand it because Biden or Trump, neither one of them policies is going to help a genuine person refugee. Um, because I look at also what they surround themselves with. Who is Biden surrounding himself with? Who is Trump surrounding himself with? Who are they appointing in these positions of office? Are they appointing Christians? Let's say uh, HUD, uh, Housing Urban Development, Ben Carson. Talk about a great guy that would be perfect for refugees in the refugee situation. I, I know some of the people in Washington, as do you, and they were looking into some things to really help the genuine refugee. So I think we just, we listen too much to maybe the news outlets um, and we don't really look at what the Bible says and also what, what really the policy uh, what will actually do. So the short answer is <clears throat> voting Democrat will not help uh, refugees 1% more. I, I actually believe it would hurt that whole cause. Um, so the, yeah, the, to answer your question, you know, I, I know, uh, Turning Point USA, I, I, I speak at some of their events sometimes, you know, they came out and were the, this thought about you can't be a crit. And I've, I've, I've made statements like that. So her heart is right. But if you're going to vote policy, you, 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 a, a Democrat, what the Democratic platform is, you, you, it doesn't line up with scripture at all regarding the platform and the policy. So that's why they say that. Yet you, to be a Democrat and vote for abortion, you know, even back at embryonic stem cell research, the border crisis, a transitioning, gender transitioning, gender fluidity, the pornogra pornographic books we're allowing into our kindergarten classes and, and libraries. You, no, you, there's no way. There's no way you can embrace that. And so I hope that makes sense. But that's when people say that, that's what they mean. We can appreciate her heart where it's at, but the policies are very destructive for our nation. Now, you know, I can't speak for her, but a, uh, you know, a critic might come back and say, well, do you think that everything in the Republican platform, I mean, you've heard this before, everything in the Republican yeah. platform aligns with scripture then? And how would you respond to somebody who would ask you that? 
<clears throat> yeah, no, I, I would say absolutely not. And it needs to be called out. And I call out some of it in my articles. But we have to remember as, as Christians, and this is even biblical, if everything is a priority, then nothing is. If, if everything's a, pri- well, what about this? What about that? So what, it, what is priority to God? You know, even in our, in the, in the forming of our nation, life, liberty, the pursuit of, pursuit of happiness. So yeah, we do put not being able to murder children up there high. We do put then being able to protect our kids by our border up there high. Then we put financial and fiscal responsibility up there pretty high. And then we put gender identity. What is, how has God created them versus this, this perversion? Yeah, we put that up there pretty high. And so yeah, these, these hot button, very important biblical political issues are definitely at the forefront. Um, now you can have imperfect people, obviously in office, but if the policies are moving back to God, uh, even though the people aren't, um, you know, that's, I mean, I think that's the heart of, of every believer. And Hey, the bottom line is we don't have Jesus Christ running for office. Nobody's really happy with the, you know, what, what we, what we're up against here. But we can see that there's just uh, some enormous uh, change that needs to happen, needs to happen ASAP. So, yeah, there are corruption in every political party, in every person. Uh, but, again, we have to look at what is the direction. Everything I just listed is huge. It is, it is huge. It will actually make or break a nation. And that's what I think uh, China, Russia, and others are even watching. They're watching America implode from the inside out. They won't even have to shoot a, wep- uh, a bullet. Because they're watching us implode from the inside out. Arnold Toynbee wrote about this even in the 1960s, that every single empire that has collapsed, 19 of the 21 empires that have collapsed, have collapsed when they are in the moral decadent decay that America is in today. And that was in the 1960s, he said that. So yeah, we just, it, the, 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 uh, the issues are huge, and so we can't avoid them. Well, that sort of dovetails with what Hannah from Leicester wrote in about. She she said, hey, I feel like British politics are following suit with America and that we're getting more and more polarized and seeing extreme policies on the left and the right. Is there any way back to a middle ground? And could true Christian witness and political involvement be the answer? What would you say to that? Well, fortunately, in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, there are solid believers as well. Um Here's what we have to remember, though. In order to find common ground, right, sides to work together, they both have to humble themselves. <laughs> they, bo- they both have to humble themselves and say, hey, guys, for the, for the betterment of America, or in your case, or, or they're listening, UK, we've got to humble ourselves. We've got to put some of these agendas on the side. We've got to say what is best for the people. And we're not, you know, all these other things going on. And I just don't see that happening. Um, so there is a way to find that middle ground, but we have to remember as believers, as looking at the Bible, the Bible is, it cannot be compromised. Uh, we don't pick and choose. It's, we're not, we're not at a, a smorgasbord. I like this from the old, I don't like this though from the old Testament. I like this from the new. So in order to find commonality, um, we have to, you know, get back to what, what does God really say? And the big divide in our country, to be honest with you, is do we believe in the inerrancy and authoritative value of God's word? It's authoritative and it's inerrant. If, if we have that, we can be united. If we don't have that, then we have this, these ridiculous things out there saying boys, boys can be girls and girls can be boys as long as they want to. And uh, men can become pregnant. We can we can breastfeed. It's like, am I in the twilight zone? This is this is in- incredible. And so that's why, yes, it's a lovely concept, right? But I don't think we can be united because true unity is unity around the truths found in God's word. Mm. All right. So this next question, uh, Lewis from Houston is really trying to throw you for a loop here because the <laughs> the question is, would Jesus vote for Trump? Or Biden? It's that is the simple question that Lewis okay. is asking. And if you have any throwbacks, Billy, you can you can throw throw some things at me too. Um, well, Jesus is King King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I don't I don't think he'd be voting for anybody uh, if, because obviously. But I understand this question. So what I would do is um, I would look at how it was when because a lot of people say, well, look at you know the Jesus didn't say anything about politics, didn't get involved. 
But we have a different government than they did in Rome. In Rome, it was Nero, Caesar Nero. Caesar was his title, Nero was his name. They had, that, that was it. You bow to Caesar. You, now, could you go and try to make a difference as a, a Roman authority and be, be gracious to the poor? Yeah, you, you could make a little bit of a difference. But then God, I believe, gave us a republic. Uh, was it Benjamin Franklin who said, you have a republic as long as you can keep it? And so now we look as a republic. We want to put people in positions of office who are going to uphold or bring back God's word. They're not going to be embarrassed to have the Ten Commandments in schoolhouses or in court buildings. They're not going to be embarrassed to pray before a meeting. They're not going to. So Jesus or Paul or whoever would probably, as a citizen, vote according to what is going to elevate and bring back God's word. I mean, that would be my only conclusion. Mm. Well, you know. So obviously, yeah, I mean, if you look at what Biden stands for and what Trump stands for, um, not, and I shouldn't even say stands for, I would say if you look at, at what the Biden policies are versus the Trump policies, if you look at who Biden is putting and uh, in, in surrounding himself with and positions of, of leadership in the White House and in, in other areas, and if you look at who Trump is going to put in positions of leadership, remember Mike Pompeo, Tony Perkins at the Family Research Council, uh, Ben Carson, we just saw, uh, head of education was a, was a, I think a solid Christian Baptist woman. So if you look at all these people, Betsy they're going to put in office. Yeah, Betsy DeVos. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a no brainer. Uh, on, on that, because you look at the, you, you, yeah. and again, I know people, well, character matters and it does care. Of course, character matters, but we, I mean, what are we supposed to do? I mean, we have, it's like Winston, Winston Churchill, remember, you know, scotch drinking, you know, cursing. I love uh, his biography, but we need, you know, they need a Winston Churchill, uh, not, uh, not a Chamberlain to defeat Hitler. And so kind of we're in the same, same boat, I believe. Yeah, it is. It is a very interesting position. And I'd love to get your take on this before we take our, our last question from Drew here. But there was a, a time in politics and especially in, in America among a lot of evangelical Christians and, and other believers where, you know, we, we have this almost inversion right now because character has sort of moved to the wayside in some ways because of the policy issues right on one side and. Mm -hmm. um, but yet there was a time when when former President Bill Clinton and others, when their character wasn't standing up to what people felt it should. And many of the people now kind of saying, well, we can't really put character at the center. They were back then very much putting character at the center. In fact, some of those same leaders and people have changed position when it comes to Trump. What do you make of that? And how do you make sense of that? You know, just watching yeah. it happen because it's just well, a reality. It is it is happening. Yeah, and I, I've studied this quite extensively. If you go back, let's even let's not go back too far. Let's go back um, 1930s, 40s, 50s, right? The character of the president, of course, character is so important. But if you look at the political, the political differences between the Republican and the Democrat, actually, Republicans started under Abraham Lincoln, you know, in the fight against slavery. But uh, they were talking about, um, let's say, our trade with China. Or we want to lend, you know, France some money, or we need to renavigate the uh, the the shipping towards the Atlantic or the Panama Canal, right? And so, yeah, yeah, we want the character of the person, the character man. Now we are, I mean, like it's it's not everything's off the table, but yes, character is so important. But now we're talking about murdering children. We're talking about transgender surgery and political agendas and this gross per perversion across our land. I mean, we, we've just we've just amped it up by a thousand. So I think that's the whole. I, I wish I, I think I had a little you know scale. Yeah, I love character. Character matters, but he's also not pastor in chief. He's commander in chief. And so we look at where we're at. We're tilting that scale. Okay, if somebody doesn't have the character, man, I don't like their character, but boy, they are going to fight for us like never before. They're going to put people in positions of leadership <clears throat> that is so key. They're going to make some financial decisions that need to be made. They're going to, they're going to intimidate China and Russia and, and again, you know, put us uh, back on, on fearing God more than man. I mean, it just, it, to me, it's, it's a no brainer. Uh, I, on how I hope I explained that well because I don't want people to think character doesn't matter, but we're at the point. For example, if I've got Jewish believer or Jewish friends, Muslim friends, uh, Mormon friends, New Age friends, Hindu friends, all on my street, right? 
I, I'm not going to really care too much about the neighborhood protecting the protector uh, uh, chief there. You know, well, he was out late last night. He got a little drunk. And uh, yeah, if he's, is he protecting my family? Is he protecting our street? You know, I mean, yes, but look at the overall. I mean, he, we're talking about the health and welfare of my children and your children, grandchildren. So yes, character matters, but what, what, what they do can overshadow that. Again, biblically speaking, God used Cyrus, Saul's character. What about Rehoboam, Jeroboam, Asa, Uzziah, Manasseh, Ahab? I mean, God used ungodly people to accomplish godly means. Well, and I, you know, I don't want to be redundant here. I do want to read Drew's question from Sheffield because oh, sorry, he, yeah. he was addressing this yeah. and Drew, no, no, this is what you just said was very helpful. You're talking about context as well, which I think people are going to disagree, obviously, but you're yeah. talking about context. You went back historically, how things have changed in context, you know, policy wise and how that might necessitate based on options, you know, in your view, a different option, right? Or the only, right. I mean, you have two, at the end of the day, you have two options. And so people have to weigh what they think is more important in an election. Now, Drew says, I'm an atheist and can't, and can't understand my Christian neighbor's political decisions. I find it, I'm going to read you everything he wrote here because it's very interesting. He said, I find it arrogant to claim that Republican policies are the Christian choice when so much of Republican leadership behavior lacks integrity and their policies excluding of a large part of society. Surely Jesus, who I don't believe was the son of God, he's an atheist, uh, but still a good guy who healed the sick, welcomed the outsider, forgave the sinful and built social borders would side with more of the democratic values of inclusivity. Uh, so uh, that's where he left the question. And, you know, you were yeah. speaking to this a little bit, but I'd love for you to address that specifically. Yeah. And, and well, we have to remember, you know, Jesus, like C.S. Lewis said, I think from the UK, right? Uh, Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic or the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, that, that would be a whole different topic. Um, but when he talks about what if I read between the language here, inclusivity basically leave leave people alone if they want to get abortion, if they their sexual preference, you know, just you know, Jesus would love people, right? But that's why when I what I said earlier is this whole this whole f friction is really on the authoritative, inerrant word of God. Is it are these practices sinful? Are they wrong? Are they demeaning? Are they hurting children? So we would say yes, they are. So that's what I would say with the Democratic Party platform is actually more harmful to people. It doesn't mean we give in to what they want to do. It just says, hey, that lifestyle is very destructive, and here's why. But as an atheist, of course, he's not going to see it that way uh, because as you're seeking God as an atheist or agnostic is more seeking God, atheist believes there's no God, you know, you 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 really struggle with, I remember this in my 20s, it's it's feelings. You know, I feel this way. Right. I feel like in their case, I feel like same sex attracted or I feel that this is I feel and we our feelings must go under the gauge of scripture where without God, we don't we don't have any gauge of scripture. So we have to go by our feelings. That's why the book of Judges says every man doing what was right in his own eyes. And so that's why there is another big debate. If I want to be a girl, I can be a girl. If I think I can be pregnant, I can think I can be pregnant. And so these feelings or how I was born trump the scripture. No pun intended there, right? And so as a Christian, that's why we put that, that we put that the other way, that scripture is actually the foundation. Scripture is what we look at, but we don't go and we, I, I hate, I hate these people. I love these people. I love them enough to speak the truth and love and say, I love you, but hey, this is what God's word says. This is a destructive pattern. And so I think all this hate mongering homophobe is a complete lie. It's not true. Uh, actually, we love people enough to, to tell them the truth. And so that's why there is a, a divide. Um, and why we look at things differently. One looks at, feelings, how I feel, leave people alone. The other looks at the truth of God's word. You know, I was born, Billy, I was born to lie. I was born to steal. I was born to commit adultery. I was born to be a thief. That doesn't make it right. To me, that's why it pointed me to the Savior, pointed me to God is for that very reason.
Well, we are going to come back in just a moment. We got to take a quick break. When we do come back, we're going to get into so many other elements of this, how people can find hope, but also what you believe the real solution from your perspective is. Of course, we are going to have other perspectives. I know if you're watching or listening to this, there may be things you've agreed with, things you you haven't as a listener or a viewer, um, but understanding that there is a, a series we're doing on this. We will have others on with different perspectives on these issues as well. And we want you to get in touch with us on social media. Of course, it's at unbelievable. Unbelievable FE on X, Premier Unbelievable for Instagram or Facebook as well. You can interact with us over on those platforms. Hit that subscribe button or take a moment to follow or rate the podcast. We will see you again in just a moment. I, I would ask Tom this, and this is a, a surprising question, maybe, to nominate for me one thing, just one thing that Christianity has introduced that doesn't have some source, some parallel, some analogy in in previous and in other civilizations. The ideal of of lifelong uh, matrimony, I think that's a a very distinctive Christian concept. I think the the category of of what by the 19th century is coming to be categorized as as homosexuality and heterosexuality, I think they have no precedence. I think the notion of secularism, the idea of there being religions, I think all these are entirely exclusive to uh, Christian civilization. I think the concept of science as it emerges in the 19th century, I think is entirely exclusive to uh, to, to, to Christian civilization. I think the idea that um, human beings are created in the image of God, that is obviously something that Christian and share with uh, with Jews uh, gives a degree of dignity to human beings that no other cultural tradition that I'm aware of even remotely approximates. Welcome back. You're listening to Unbelievable with me, Billy Hollowell, and with my guest, Shane Eidelman. We still have plenty to cover how God has really um, made it explicit how we engage in politics. That's one of the things we're talking about from Shane's perspective and from a Christian perspective. How do we do that? How do we balance you know, faith and politics and all of the chaos that is going on in the culture around us? You know, Shane, as we come back here, we took some questions from listeners in the last segment. But one of the things, regardless of where people stand, um, you know, on these issues, how do we give people who are disillusioned by the current state of politics and culture hope? How do we do that right now? Mm. That's easy because I do it every Sunday preaching. So I can, I can answer this one. Oh, you know, I should mention that all of my books are actually available as free downloads at our church website. So if people want additional information on everything I'm talking about, fasting and revival and politics, it's all at westsidechristianfellowship.org. So they're free downloads. There's no no cost there at the church website. Um, So the key is to find that hope is what do we focus on? See, hope is where, where are my affections lying? What is my hope resting in? So if my hope is resting in the stock market, 401k, uh, 2024 election, I'm going to be, I'm going to be like a, toss to and fro back and forth, right? Like uh, by every wind that is blowing in. And so, yeah, I mean, think about this. I'm a pastor in Los Angeles County. I've got four daughters and a son I'm raising in this environment. And so I, I, I got it. But the more I'm in God's word, the more I'm, I'm just n- realizing his sovereignty is my sanity, his sovereign control. And, and if I lose everything, I've still got him. And constantly keeping our hope focused on him, hope, Jesus, the hope for this world. And, 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 and that's where true hope comes from. Happiness comes from the word happenstance, you're right? It's what's ever happening to me. So if I'm up, I'm up. If I'm down, I'm down. So that's where as believers, but we have to stay in the word. We have to stay in prayer, worship. You know, like Paul said, let psalms and, and singing come from your heart and, and be thankful. Most of us are not thankful. We're really bitter and critical. And we know what happened to the children of Israel when they were bitter and critical. So, uh, but the more I listen to, whether it's CNN, Fox News, right? Drudge Report, Huffington Post, I'm just, you know, the more I read what's going on, the more negative I become. And I don't think we're designed to know what's going around on all over the world, all this negativity, all this sex trafficking, all the, and it can really, it can really make you, um, really make you depressed because as a man thinketh in his heart, that's why Paul said, whatever things are pure, 
honest, noble, and upright. Meditate on these things. Out of that, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. So we just got to get believers back into God's word, back into fellowship at church, back into thankfulness. Yeah, be in tune with what's going on. Be be smart and strategic, and use wisdom and discernment. But we've got to be focusing a lot more on God than our problems. You know, and, and I know that you come at this obviously from a Christian perspective and. You know, when you look at the dynamics, I want you to speak to both sides, meaning people who have faith, those who don't on this, because one of the big negatives that has come out of what you just described and all of this tension is that people, because of political activism, political views, they really, that all comes at the expense of relationships, right? You have a situation where people are so horrified by some of the things that you described, whether it be abortion or gender, or on the other side, people are horrified by feeling as though Republicans aren't living up to certain standards they believe, inclusivity, whatever it is. And so it used to be that people could have those disagreements and have relationships still. But what we've watched in recent years is the tearing apart of those relationships. What does it look like? And you could talk from a general perspective and also from a Christian perspective if you want, for people to engage in a way where they hold strong to those strong beliefs that you have while not kicking everybody out of their life and destroying relationships. Yeah, and that depends on the, you know the the two individuals of course because uh, even Christians can be, you know, upset at things and so can and I actually don't use I don't call myself a, a Republican or just, I'm like what does God's word say and and how can I vote accordingly? So whether it's a Democrat, independent, Republican, I mean, um it's it's what 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 is what's God's word say on these important issues, um, and so you do as a believer you have to be the better person. You have to you know as as the volume goes up, yours goes down. You know you you uh, season your words with grace. You seek. I like to seek to listen. You know instead of always you know you're always preparing what to say uh, versus okay I'm listening. I see where you're coming from. I can see where you're where you're coming from, and I can genuinely see where someone is coming from that says hey exclusivity, you know, just let people do what they want. And that's, we actually do that. It's like, Hey, if that's how they want to live, absolutely. That's, I'm not going to make a judgment call, but now when your politics is going into a kindergarten class and a transgender man dressed as a provocative woman can read to my six-year-old and tell them very bad things in a book. See, now I have a problem with it. So it's not really about exclusivity. It's about where does that end up? Where does it take us? Where's that line in the sand being drawn? So I think that's a big misconception too. I'm all for, hey, if you want to dress up, you want to be, that's, that's your, that's up to you. I have no say so on it. But when it begins to affect society, because remember, we, we have a moral responsibility at to society, even in, 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 in America, freedom, of, freedom of press, freedom of speech actually had a covering. It had a, it had a, it had boundaries. If it was going to hurt the welfare of society, it was not to be allowed. That's why something like pornography should never be allowed as expression of free speech. But to answer your question, the, the, the believer has to be the better person and you have to work on relationships. Hey, don't let this divide us. Um, and pride. That's why, that's why this is so hot. It's pride, pride on both sides. Of course, I can, I can be a prideful man. <laughs> I'm working on pride until the day I die right? Through repentance, humility, God help me. I don't want to be that way. So I think you can, because I, I know a lot of, I've got f- nieces, nephews on the, on the, who are Democrats. I've got uh, friends I know, people I know. We don't, you don't really throw fuel on the fire. You know what I mean? They, they know what you believe and, and I'm just there to love them. Um, sometimes we give to them benevolence. We help them. They already know where I stand. So you don't need to, you know, that's pride. Pride is wanting to constantly argue and debate. And you go, oh, look what Biden did. Aha, look what Trump did. You're, you're constantly fueling those flames. You want to avoid that at all costs as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you did that I do think is interesting, you brought it up earlier because when we talk about character in politicians and we talk about the, the Bible from a Christian perspective, right? right. And, and the Old Testament, the New Testament, one of the most interesting things, and I've heard a lot of atheists and Christians talk about this with scripture and the Bible is that it it does not make everybody look good. The negative, mm-hmm. difficult parts of people's stories, yes. the horrible behaviors, those things are included in multitudes of stories throughout. Um, so you would assume if you were trying to write a book and you were trying to make something up, you would make it up and put in a, a whole bunch of content that only made somebody look good. And I bring that up because when it comes to 
character. Can you speak a little bit more to that? When people do say, well, the character's bad, you know, how has, in your view, God maybe used people with bad character in the past mm -hmm. for for God's purposes. Right. Well, it's funny you said that because when I was searching and, you know, deciding on, you know, fully surrendering to God or not, looking at the Bible, you know, you look at, you know, written over 1500 years, what, 60 different, 40 different authors on different continents, uh, all saying the same thing. Uh, the vulnerability, I looked at the scientific accuracy, the prophetic accuracy, the archaeological accuracy, the historical accuracy of the Bible. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. Uh, once you begin to, to delve into it. So, so that's when it became the standard. It wasn't like Christians check our brain at the door and, you know, and like, Oh yeah, let me just, let me just believe that there's fairy tale, you know, what, you know those little, uh, things, Disneyland, my kids like. Um, but no, it takes a lot of, of strength and, uh, faith and also looking into the facts as well. I mean, there's a lot of examples you have. Let's say someone, um, like Pharaoh or wicked kings or even uh, some people in the New Testament, where God would actually use ungodly people to accomplish his will, what he wanted to, to do. But then he would also take people like uh, David, right? King David, Bathsheba, murder, uh, Paul, the apostle Paul. Uh, he would take Elisha and Elijah and these, these men. But the key to these men were in, because there's no perfect person out there. God uses broken people. I'm a very broken person and he uses, he chooses to still use me. But the difference is the Davids, the Pauls, those who are broken, try to remain that spirit of, try to maintain that spirit of humility saying, God, I'm broken. I blew it. I need your help. I need your, and it's called repentance. Repentance is changing the way I think the wrong thinking and repenting, which changes my actions back towards God. So God used, uses flawed individuals. That's the, that's the only thing that's available. So to encourage those people, if you're not perfect, you've messed up, you know, God, you'll be amazed at what God can do with humility. It, absolutely amazed at what he can do with humility. So yeah, he uses flawed individuals. And that's a great point when it comes to politics. You know, we know that he's using flawed individuals. Even the most perfect candidate is going to have you know, a, a lot of, of flaws that, that they'll have to work through. You know, one of, one of the, the big questions, and it's come up quite a bit, you know, obviously we're not going to do a segment here because we're almost coming out around to the end on Christian nationalism, but this is something we've talked about on the show before. And it's obviously a big debate and a big issue. But one question that comes out of that is, should the Christian worldview promote religious liberty for all, including non-believers? And, and what your take is on, on that? Yeah. And well, first, I think it'd be important to clarify, um, true Christian nationalism is when you're putting country over God, when it's about when the cross is draped by a flag, when Trump is our savior, when it's the national identity, that, that is, that's not good. But people who believe in God they love their family and they want to see God's word govern the land. They're called Christian national. That's, that's, that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's not true. We, we put God first and yes, our, our political beliefs matter. So again, in America, uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, we welcomed all types of belief systems, right? The, from the atheist, the agnostic to Hindu, Muslim. So there's, there's something between difference between welcoming and affirming because all religions can be wrong, but they cannot all be right. So as Christians, the nation was built. If you look at again, the school system, the education, the educational, even the rules of Harvard, right? Harvard, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and to put Jesus Christ at the bottom of all sound knowledge and learning. That's Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Some of those might be in the UK though. Now I'm, I'm saying Cambridge, right? And, uh, and so you see this foundation that God, God's word was built upon. So I can welcome those with other beliefs, right? And they have freedom to believe whatever they want. But our system of government, our system of government is built on the principles of God's word. So that can't be, you know, I'm not calling for a theocracy. I'm not calling for, I'm just calling for principled centered leadership that looks to God's word as a standard. So that's why you can't have all these different religions because they're all they're, they're all different. 
Um, so I hope that makes sense. We can welcome everyone believes what they want, but as, but of course we're not there anymore as America. I'm talking about, you know, 1800s, early 1900s. Y you, you didn't have to become a Christian. Um, that's why we're called a Christian nation. Not that everyone was a Christian, but it was built on the foundation of God's word. And people would, would, would either agree with that or they, they wouldn't, but you can't have a, a melting pot of religion because that, directly opposes actually what God's word says. So I want to spend the last, you know, few minutes that we have here on on the show talking about, you know, we've talked about many solutions from your perspective of what Christians can do when it comes to politics and what people can do in general when it comes to right. navigating the differences that that everybody has right now. But one of the things as a pastor, obviously your top thing from your view is pointing people toward faith and this issue of revival, this idea of people in mass coming coming to the Lord, experiencing God in some way. Talk a little bit in your view, because people around these parts in, in America and the UK are looking more and more to politics as the solution. Politics, they're right. going to solve it. It's going to be, no. and that's why so much of this anger is forming. Talk about the real solution in your view. Yeah, I mean, in, in the purest sense of explaining this, politics should flow out of a right relationship with God, right? God and then politics, our belief system flows out from that. So if something is broke and we see all this division, it's the spiritual condition of her people. And that's why I say America has, and probably the UK has stage four spiritual cancer. We are dying inside. It is metastasized to all areas of, of government, our schools. So when that happens, there's only one cure, one remedy, one solution, and that is if God happens to bring another spiritual awakening. He actually did that in the UK. Wells in Scotland are the number one areas of revival throughout the whole world. Uh, Daniel, Her Daniel Rollins, Her uh, Hal Harris, Griffin Jones in the 1700s in the area of Wells. You've got New Hebrides. You've got Duncan Campbell. And then, of course, the First Great Awakening, Wesley. And, and what the, the significance is in these times of dark moments that uh, really the black plague up to the revolutionary war and all the different things. These dark moments is God would refresh his people with revival. It's not a weird word. It just means awakening that which was, is dead, you know, spiritual resuscitation, <laughs> right? God breathes in us like Isaiah 64. Oh God, would you rend the heavens? Come down, rip open the heavens, come down and visit your people again. Uh, I think it was another one of the prophets cried out, God, give us a measure of revival in our bondage. So that's our only hope. Our only hope is another spiritual awakening, but it doesn't come on Air Force One. Uh, it doesn't come watching Netflix all day. It comes from humble, broken people crying out to God, prayer meetings, uh, church worship services as God's people begin to seek him like never before and break up their follow ground, their pride, their arrogance. God brings a refreshing move of his spirit. And I'm in Los Angeles County. We have to baptize. We have to have the baptismal full every weekend. We have baptisms every single Sunday at our church, LA County, we see marriages restored. We see fentanyl and alcoholism being broken. We see a uh, prodigal sons coming home every single week. It's amazing what God is doing. And so that is our only hope God to revive his church, but we've got to position ourselves. We, we have to be broken and humble and, and, and seeking the heart of God like never before. And, and that's the prayer. God looks for those who are seeking him. If you seek me, with all of your heart, you will find me. And boy, when you find him, there's no letting go. It's amazing what he does. So, you know, based on what you were just saying before about baptisms every week and what you're seeing happen and these Asbury revival moments, all these things we've seen happen, do you think this is on the uptick right now, even though we're having all of this chaos and consternation politically, that we're also seeing a spiritual revival happen? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's hard to really know because sometimes when we think of revival, right, we think of only the big revivals uh, that, that are well-known, books have been written about it, but God is reviving people at a lot. I mean, I've got friends in Tennessee. I talk with Kansas City, Texas, Florida, where, I mean, the churches are full, people are hungry, where people are seeing, or just seeing so much take place, not on a mass scale. That's where I guess it can get frustrating, right? You know, and, um, and so I don't think we see it yet on a mass scale, but we see it definitely at a lot of the individual churches hungry for more of God and fire for more of God. Now, will that 
because I get this pushback a lot. You know, Shane, haven't you read Revelation? You know, it doesn't really matter. We're going down. There's nothing we can do. Well, hypothetically speaking, let's say, let's say, yeah, it's, this is, you know, we, there's nothing we can do anymore. That's not the position of a believer. The po- position of a believer is always do business until I return. Expose the unfruitful works of darkness. Contend for what is right. Contend for the truth. Pray for revival. Usher in another awakening. So, to me, it doesn't, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. We're not going to see the America or the UK of the 1950s again, you know, the 1940s utopia. We're going to, it, it could be messy the whole way through, but uh, we want to uh, ignite a passion for God like we've never seen before. How do we know he won't awaken some areas of California or of throughout the United States or there in the UK again, where, where so many great revivals once once stood uh, back in Spurgeon's church, even, you know, you go back farther to a lot of the, the great awakenings. You know, final question for you, you know, how can younger Christians be encouraged to engage in public life despite the fear of backlash or cancellation? And we didn't really get into that, but there are a lot of fears right now. How can they engage? If you could just quickly give us a, a quick tip for them. Yeah, I mean, it's very sad. It really is. I've, I've been asked to run for some pretty big offices here in California, but, you know, just Unless it's God, of course, you, 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 good idea isn't always a God idea. Plus, the, I mean, they'll they'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal, they'll do whatever you can to take you out. So it, it is dirty. The council culture is is terrible. But as a young Christian, I just say, you know, g- just get on fire for God and see what He does with you. Don't worry about man. Don't fear man. Uh, don't focus too much on politics. I don't think it should be our focus. I think our focus needs to be on God and our relationship with Jesus and the, and the word of God guiding us. But from that, you're going to start to develop a hunger, right? Um, man, God's given me this hunger. I don't know what to do with it. Well, that's a good, a good indication. That's what he's calling you to do. So I think so many times, what is God's will? Should I do this? I want to be more involved. Bury your face in his word, get humble and broken and say, Lord, I'm however you want to use me. And uh, boy, you'll be amazed at what he would do with you. In 2008, I remember I was, I was in construction. Like I'm a heavy equipment operator, I'm working dirt, I'm in construction, and I've just asked, cried out to God to use me. And this, you know, this is the byproduct of of just Him working in me. And a person listening is no different. I'm no, I'm not special. I've got many uh, cracks in my armor as well. I'm a broken man, hard childhood, you know, and everything I, I discuss at the opening of this podcast. Uh, but God can use the le- He often chooses the least likely. Uh, as well. Mm. You know, you don't have to have a degree. You don't have to have tons of experience. Just surrender to God and then watch what he does. And then you don't fear man because you fear God more. Well, that is a beautiful place for us to close today. We're going to have to finish it there. Thank you to my guest, Shane Eidelman. We want to make sure all of you out there hit that subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, follow Premier Unbelievable on social media on X. It's at Unbelievable FE or on Facebook and Instagram. It's at Premier Unbelievable. Be sure to rate and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. It has been great to be with all of you, and we'll see you again next time. Until then, from me, Billy Hollowell, and the team, goodbye. <laughs>